Acts chapter 2 verse 42 And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers, right? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. So we come now to fellowship. We must continue steadfastly in fellowship. And we are having fellowship here, aren't we? In this church camp. And how we enjoy the fellowship with fellow believers. And it really encourages our heart. Fellowship is so important. It, it, really, uh, it really is a means of grace. Right? When we gather together to study the Bible together, to talk of spiritual things of the kingdom of God, and to share one another's lives, our struggles, our triumphs, and, and our testimonies of God's providence in our lives, how He has provided, how He has guided and led, and things like this. I mean, we do encourage one another, and we also provoke one another unto love and the good works. So, so fellowship is important. And uh, someone asked me at dinner time, you know, what, what is heaven going to be like? Is it, I thought it's just worship. You know, then now you tell me there's Bible study, you know, things like this. Yeah, no, it's not just worship. Of course, worship is first and foremost. But we worship God in so many ways. Right now, as we, as we consider and meditate on God's Word, this is part of worship, the worship of the Lord. Right? When you meditate on His Word, and you want to glorify Him by knowing Him more and more, uh, your heartfelt desire and wanting to study the Scriptures is worshipful. Study of God's Word must be worshipful for it to be beneficial. Right? Some people just study God's Word as just literature. It's not going to benefit you. But if we study God's Word as God's Word because we believe in Him, we know who He is, and we study worshipfully, uh, we get a whole lot of blessing. And then we understand the Lord. And then when we know the Lord more and more, we want to love Him more and more, serve Him more and more. You see, that is... So here we are worshipping the Lord. And yes, there's Bible study and a whole lot of other things. I believe there's going to be a whole lot of fellowship in heaven as well. Fellowship with Christians from all over the world. Every tribe, nation, tongue, language. Past, present and future. And people whom we are, whom we are studying in the Bible, we will get to know right, in heaven itself. Don't you want to talk to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Don't you want to talk with, you know, the judges in the Old Testament, Gideon and Samson, right? Don't you want to talk to Moses and Joshua? Peter, James, John, Paul? I'm looking forward to having fellowship with them. I have so many questions for them. Questions you all sometimes ask me, I can't answer. I say, I'll go to heaven and ask them for you. Well, anyway, you can ask them yourself. You know, you're there already. So many things to, to learn and study. And how we will be praising the Lord together. Uh, then we see God is so good, so good to us, so gracious to us. And now we're in heaven, enjoying all these things. We don't deserve all these things. But we're now here, uh, experiencing the fulfillment of His promises. And then God has led and guided us in so many different ways, mysterious ways, providentially. Each one of us have our own story to tell. So I'm sure they will be interested to know, well, how do you come to a saving knowledge of Christ? And things like this. So there'll be a whole lot of sharing and so many right, others as well. So I always tell... Uh, my church members, when we are in church camp, you know, when you're in a church camp, you're tasting a slice of heaven on earth, right? You're getting a glimpse of heaven on earth. And I'm sure in heaven it will be much, much more wonderful. 
and enjoyable, right? Are you enjoying the camp thus far? I've attended so many church camps and every church camp is good, right? I've never come across anyone telling me, you know, I went to church camp and it's no good, you know, it's, it's always good. When it's done rightly, right? When you come with the right spirit and the Lord is number one and you focus on God's word and you have fellowship in His name, it's all so wonderful. Okay, so fellowship. They had this kind of a fellowship. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. So what is fellowship? The word fellowship here in the original is significant, I think instructive. Koinonia, I think you have heard this word before, right? Koinonia means fellowship. And, and it comes from the root word koinos. And koinos means common. In fact, this word is found in the text, right? You look at verse 44. Says here, and all that believed were together and had all things common. Common. Uh, koinos, right? The word is koinos over here. And from koinos, that's where we get the word koinonia. Uh, this fellowship, this communion, or this community, or this, this communism. Not communism, but this communism that we have right, in the Lord Jesus Christ. This fellowship, communism. Communism is it's not communism. You may want to call it biblical communism, secular political communism, when you know they, they want to be all equal, share everything, and so on and so forth. It's not a bad idea, but in, in but let me explain. I don't say I'm advocating communism, which is anti-God, anti-religion, really, atheistic. Communism, this sharing, everybody having equal share and everything in common, in the political realm, in the secular realm, is something forced on you by law, right? By legislation, by law, and something you are coerced to do and forced to do. Or forced to be. But biblical Christian communism, or rather communism, is very different. It's something that is, is motivated not by law, but by love, right? By love and by, by this uh, willingness on our part, right? To share, to distribute, to communicate. Right? to participate and to partake of the sufferings of others and things like this to share what we have moved by love by Christ right and out of of a willing heart not something forced so this is the word here fellowship right and that's the idea of the word koinonia, this, this communism in this community that we are and have, that is Christian, that is founded in the name of Christ, based on scripture, we come together to share one another's burdens and share one another's joys also, right? Share with one another's needs and wants and things of that sort and nature. So it's something important, right, that we must have. That's why when you become a Christian, you're not alone. You cannot be alone. A Christian is not lonely. A Christian has companionship, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in the family of God. And God is our Father, the Lord Jesus, right, our supreme, superior brother, the Holy Spirit, our comforter, our advocate, and then we have brothers and sisters in Christ. 
in this covenant community. And one characteristic of the covenant community is fellowship, right? Koinonia. We have things in common. So over here, now, but fellowship. What more about fellowship? You know, often I hear people defining fellowship as all the fellows in the ship. Have you heard, heard that before? All the fellows in the ship. Not wrong, right, to think of it in that way. All the fellows in the ship, right, involves people, involves place, location, and everyone together. But what, what more? What else? They don't go further to, so what about these people? What are they doing? Who are they? Right? Why are they in this ship? There's more to, to it than all the fellows in the ship. Just like at dinner time, and Alan was sharing how he was in a university fellowship. And then they always say, well, we want to go back to the Bible, back to the Bible, back to the Bible. But then after that, there's nothing more, all right? Back to the Bible, and then they stop there. But what about the Bible? Right? What more about the Bible? They can't tell, they can't say, but it's back to the Bible. So all the fellows in the ship, so what about them? Right? What's the big deal about being together in the ship? What more? What are they doing? What are they sharing? What are they going through? Right? So what about fellowship? So over here in this text, uh, we are instructed what a fellowship should be and what a fellowship should do. Okay? So there are th two things here. There are two aspects to fellowship. And, and for tonight, I will deal with the first aspect. And God willing, tomorrow, right? if we are not already taken up to heaven, we'll be back here. And we'll talk about fellowship in the second aspect. The first aspect is the fellowship in spirit and in doctrine. The second aspect of fellowship is fellowship in goods and in good deeds, right? In practice. So the first, fellowship in spirit and in doctrine. And this we find, all right, in verse 44, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They had fellowship with the apostles. They had fellowship with one another. And then it says here in, in verse 44, And all that believed, all the believers, were together. Uh, that is fellowship. They were together. There was unity. They were together. They were gathered together and there was unity in this togetherness. Okay. And then they had, and then it's further explained, and they, and, and they had all things common. All things common. So there's a sameness of, of mind, of spirit, and even of possessions, right? They have all things, and I believe the word all things here mean spiritual things as well as physical things, right? They were together. They had a common faith, together in doctrine, in spirit, having the same mind, same heart, same desires, right? There was this unity among them. So that's the fellowship. Fellowship, a fellowship to be a fellowship, must, there must be this, this unity, this sameness in spirit and in doctrine, right? This common faith that all of us must have and must share. So verse 44 tells us there must be this unity of faith, of belief, of doctrine, okay? A common faith. So, so we have done, we have dealt with a lot of doctrine already, right? In the first two messages, they, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And this fellowship is practically displayed and demonstrated in this sameness of mind, and of belief, a common faith, a common theology. And this tells us in a fellowship, I mean a fellowship to be a fellowship. Again, the focus must be still God's word, right? Doctrine. That's why in fellowship meetings, 
uh, we have Bible study. You cannot do without Bible study, right? We come together, yes, we share, right? We sh- uh, share our lives and then we pray together, right? Whatever prayer items we may have or struggles we go through or answered prayers, we come together, we share with one another and if there are needs, we pray for one another. But So that is part of fellowship. But also there must be the study of the Bible, right? All true fellowship must be centered in and around Scripture. It's not fun and games. Just come in to just chit-chat, catch up. Then you go to a community center, a community club. A fellowship is not a community center or community club, club, right? Some churches have fellowship groups. Taekwondo fellowship or cooking fellowship, eating fellowship, whatever other fellowship, and they call it a fellowship. But then there's no Bible study, right? no prayer, no spiritual sharing. And that's not a fellowship. Right? It's a social activity. You are socializing. You're not fellowshipping. A fellowship to be a fellowship involves doctrine. And it involves also uh, sharing of our needs, which we will discuss tomorrow, right? With regards to our goods, our possessions, doing good deeds, and uh, fellowshipping in practice. But here, fellowship in spirit and in doctrine. And it's Bible-centered. And so, uh, this morning when you had a discussion and one part of the discussion has to do with, you know, this, this love and, and, and doctrine. Love unites. There are those who say love unites and doctrine divides. So if doctrine divides, then you really cannot have fellowship, right? Doctrine, it looks like if, if doctrine does divide, then can you have this this fellowship can you have things in common fellowship should bind us together so that we become a common people having a common faith and belief having things in common but if doctrine divides then it defeats fellowship doesn't it but yet doctrine is vital for fellowship so how do you square this how do you reconcile this So the question now, and the liberals and the ecumenical people and the new evangelicals who don't believe in biblical separation, they say, well, let's just focus on love, not on doctrine. Doctrine divides. So that's what they say. But is this statement true? Think about it. Love unites. Doctrine divides. This question, true or false, this statement? If it comes out in an FEBC exam, right? <laughs> would you answer true or false? Can this statement be true? We always think of this you know, negatively. This is a false statement, a wrong statement. But can this be a true statement that love unites and then especially this one doctrine divides does doctrine divide is this a true statement i submit to you this is a true statement doctrine does divide and this division does not need to be bad in fact division in the bible can be good how do we know this you you turn to right matthew Gospel of Matthew. In fact, this is what Jesus taught. There's unbiblical division for sure, but division can be biblical. Right? Can be good and necessary. Turn to Matthew chapter 10.
Doctrine does divide, but it should not be unwelcome. Sometimes this division must be welcomed. Right? Sometimes such divisions are warranted. For we see Jesus saying here in, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 to verse 36. It says here, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. So you confess the Lord Jesus. You say, I believe in you, O Lord. You are my Lord and my Savior. You confess the Lord. You believe on him. That's good. And Jesus says, I will confess you. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. You deny him, he will deny you. Think not, and then Jesus said here in verse 34, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Uh, this is a sword. A sword of what? Division. And my teacher, my pastor, Reverend To, restated right, this verse in this way. He said, The cross is a sword that divides. The cross is a sword that divides. Yes, this is what Jesus said. You believe in me, you confess me, you will face, you will find division. And think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Look at verse 35. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. How come? There's this division even within the family. Of course, the family here, father, mother. Fellow all right, siblings at home, there's this division. Why? Because they are unbelieving and now you are believing. There are those who are, who are saved and they come from, from idolatrous right, homes and families. And then they heard the gospel, they believed, they got converted. And then in the home now, you know there's one living in true God and Jesus the, only Savior, you cannot worship idols. You can't eat food offered to idols. You can't pray to your ancestors. And things of that nature, you will no longer visit the temple. You are no longer an idol worshipper. You are now worshipping the one living and true God, the invisible God. You say, I, I cannot do these things anymore. What will you get? Will you get persecuted? You may, get ev you may be even beaten, right? Or chased out of a home. Especially you want to confess Christ. You don't, to, you don't want to compromise. You want to confess the Lord. And maintain a good testimony at home. That there is this great difference now. Light has come in my life and what you are believing in right now and doing, you are in darkness. And light and darkness cannot mix. And the darkness will go against the light. Right? There will be division. So doctrine, the gospel doctrine, divides. And it's necessary. Your faith is being tested. How would you respond? Will you deny the Lord? Or will you confess the Lord? My father was, was from an uh, unbelieving family idolatrous family, my grandparents right, in those days. And when my father got converted, became a Christian while well, he was persecuted at home. My father shared with, with us how, you know, when he knelt down to pray, my grandfather would go to him and knock him on the head. What are you doing? Prevent him from praying. He would be reading the Bible. The Bible would be taken from him and thrown away. And he was forbidden to go to church. But he would continue praying. 
you continue reading the Bible, you throw one, I get another one. You say, I cannot go to church, I will still go to church. But of course, when he comes back home, you'll get beaten and things like this. So he would not deny the Lord. He wanted to confess the Lord. But there is division between father and son, mother and son. But there's a very net necessary testimony to maintain. When you draw the line so clearly, this division makes the truth and the light very clear. And by so doing, this division is also very evangelistic. Right? You're drawing the line very clearly. What is truth? What is error? What is true? What is false? Right? What is true religion and what is not true? And then you're bearing a testimony that even when you are persecuted and beaten and scolded and unjustly treated, uh, you don't retaliate. All right? In fact, they see you now more hardworking all right? as a student, more helpful at home, more respectful, running errands and things like this. You, so you're, you, you show by your life. Right? Your life has changed, but you will not compromise your faith. There is division, but the division is a good division, which becomes very evangelistic. And years later, my grandparents' father's side, uh, they became believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, I believe, all right, in the early days when my father maintained that testimony, uh, the cross is a sword that divides. And when you take a stand, you draw the line very clearly. You show by your testimony the fact that you will not compromise. You want to confess the Lord Jesus fully. You will not deny him. And you are willing to take all the unjust all right, persecution and bear with it. All right, and yet respond lovingly to your parents who are persecuting you, well, they will start to think, oh, there's this, this change, this invisible power, right? And what is it that makes him so different? And then by God's grace, as you share the gospel and through your lips and through your deeds, your life, uh, the Spirit may begin to work right in the hearts of your loved ones. And they come to a saving knowledge of Christ eventually. So it's a good thing, good division, necessary one. And it does divide, doctrine does divide. And if done rightly and biblically, it will have, it can have a good result. Right? So it's not bad, division is not bad. But you know, the world tell, keeps telling us division, division is always no good, you know, and and unwanted. No, sometimes division is very necessary. So doctrine does divide. And we read this also in Luke chapter 12, verse 51. Jesus said, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division, right? Division. So a sword, the cross is a sword that divides. So doctrine does divide. And it is good and not bad at all, okay? Biblical division. We also see this in Romans 16, verse 17. Turn to Romans 16, verse 17. And it says here, and this is a command, I beseech you, brethren, mark them. Mark them means mark them. I mean single them out, right? Identify them. Those which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. That's division. There are those who come and bring in unholy divisions, right? Heretical divisions. Uh, this, all these are unwanted. 
And then what must you do? You must separate yourself from them. All right? There's this holy division you must apply against unholy divisions that people want to cause in the church. Mark them out, have nothing to do with them because they are contrary to the doctrine, right? singular here, the truth which you have learned. And then avoid them, avoid them. So sometimes such divisions are necessary. Church discipline, excommunication, division is necessary. Remove them from the church. Public discipline. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. It says here, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And why? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So, doctrine. True and good doctrine will lead you to divide and separate yourselves from those who are believing in false doctrines. Right? Or those who will not endure sound doctrine. But they have itchy ears and they want to hear what they want to hear from false teachers. Who will just goad them into their Lustful desires. Right? Just to hear what they want to hear. Say what they want to say. And they shall turn away their ears from truth and shall be turned under fables. So biblical division or separation is very necessary. And all these things are done to preserve the true unity of the, ch of the church based upon true doctrine. Right? So such divisions are necessary for what? Good and right and proper fellowship. Right? Biblical separation or division is necessary for sound and good and right fellowship to preserve the unity right, of the church. So doctrine does divide, for sure. And they say love unites. Not necessarily love also can divide. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13. So 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 6 says here, now the chapter on love or charity says, Charity or love rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Right? So love separates, right? has nothing to do with sin and iniquity. Love has everything to do with goodness and holiness right? and truth. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. So love also does divide, right? Keeps you away from iniquity. And it rejoices, right? It wants to be near, be found in the truth. So this statement, love unites, doctrine divides, can be a true statement seen in the right, right context, right perspective in the light of Scripture. So not necessarily wrong. Okay. And so you have here doctrine and love or truth and love. Which is more important? You know, this statement, love unites, doctrine divides, seem to tell us that love is more important than doctrine, right? But which is more important? Doctrine or truth or love? And here we, we read, the greatest of this is love. And so many people misunderstand what it means over here when, when Paul says the greatest of these is love. So love, if you have love and truth, which one is more important? 
Love or truth? Anyone? Both are equally good, important. Can one be above the other? I submit to you, they can. Which one is more important, love or truth? And I agree with Dr. John Wickham, my teacher. John Wickham said, truth is more important than love. And he says, let me tell you why. Because if you just have love without truth, it's going to be like water without control. And water without control or out of control is very what? Destructive, right? The great flood. And he, and Dr. John Wickham was an expert in the flood. He wrote a book, The Genesis Flood. How many of you have read that book? Yeah. It's an important book. It's a classic. No library should do without it. Right? And that's right. Love, you just talk about love and love which is not guided all right and channeled and controlled by truth or defined by truth can become disastrous just like water without control can be so destructive so love must be channeled right must be controlled and directed by truth for it to be what good and beneficial and productive just like water so truth he says is more important than love not that love is unimportant it's important but love for it to function rightly you must have the truth without truth things can go haywire right? and disastrous and destructive and that's very right so Yes, we know love does unite and doctrine does divide. And so this statement can be a true statement. And this is a true statement. But can it also be like this? Love, does love divide? Love divides and doctrine unites. Can this statement be true as well? Does love divide? Uh, certainly does truth unite or doctrine unite also can be true right now let's look at some passages we turn to to Ephesians chapter 4 Ephesians chapter 4 Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 to verse 16 it says here and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers take note here these people with all these gifts are involved in the ministry of the word right of doctrine I mean they're teaching right apostles and prophets and evangelists pastors and teachers they are dealing with the word right with doctrine with teaching with truth and this is done for the perfecting of the saints to cause them to be spiritually mature for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ right so important for good and solid and sound fellowship you must have all these uh, a very word focused and word-centered ministry in the right way of course in the truth Till we come to the, in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Right? So doctrine unites, tells us here. That's why God gave to the church all these people with such gifts. Of course, today no more apostles and no more prophets. But still, we have those who are engaged in the word, pastors and teachers and evangelists. Okay. We have these today for the perfecting of the saints so that all can come 
to the unity of the faith. So doctrine does unite as we see over here. And then in John 17, John 17, verse 17, says here, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. Right? So this unity comes from where? Uh, the truth of God's word. When we are sanctified by the truth of God's word through good and sound and, and holy doctrines, biblical doctrines, uh, we will become one right? in the Lord Jesus Christ. As the Father and the Son are one, having the same doctrine, same truth, so we also become one based on what? Doctrine. Okay. So doctrine does unite. Doctrine is very necessary for unity, for fellowship, right? having a common mind, a common faith, sameness of mind and spirit is all due to doctrine. Make sure you you know the doctrine, the truth of the scriptures through God's word. That's why we emphasize this so much, which we don't find in so many churches today. So you should be very thankful that in the providential care and hand of God, you're led to a church where you learn doctrine. And it's not only in your mind, but I'm sure doctrine has influenced your heart, right? your thinking and your feelings and in the, your life as a, a covenant community, right? Covenant family. You, you see the doctrine being demonstrated in very real terms, which has benefited you and, and others as well, right? In the way you interact with one another and have fellowship with one another, helping one another, loving one another, you, you will see this, right? In very real ways. And love also. They say love unites, but yes, love does unite when we have this genuine love for one another, bearing one another's burdens. We are long suffering, right? And patient with one another. I, I, it does unite, but, it, but love also can divide. And where do we learn this? You turn to John 15. Verse 18 to 20, John 15, 18 to 20, says here, If the world hate you, ye know that I hate, it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, uh, we are in the world, but not of the world. And because we are not of the world, uh, the world will hate you. I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So if you love the Lord, you don't love the world, then the world will what? The world will not love you. The world will hate you. All right? So love, love for the Lord and for His truth will cause you to be hated. There is what? This division already. See? And if you are a friend of the world, you are not no friend of God. So love not the world. The things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and so on, which you know very well. Right? Love divides. So this statement cuts both ways and both can be true. Love does unite and you love the Lord, you love one another, you know, you will, you will remove, get rid of every pride, self-ambition, envy and strife, 
A lot of divisions in the church, unholy divisions, factions, due to what? Selfish ambition, pride, worldliness that has crept into the church. Just like the Corinthian church. A whole lot of what? Factions, right? Divisions. And quarrelings. Why? Paul says, because you are carnal. You're so worldly in your thinking, in your ways. God's work must be done in God's way. But then instead of using God's way, you want to use the world's way. Then you yourself, seeking your own promotion in the church. Promotion comes from the Lord, but you say, I want this, I want that. You have this unholy ambition, fighting for power and position. And then that's why there's division in the church, envy and strife. But if there's genuine love, love for one another, and, and love involves humility, right? preferring others better than yourselves, right? esteeming others better than yourselves, not seeking personal fame or glory, or fame or gain, but because you love the Lord, uh, you will serve quietly and silently, you don't crave for attention or recognition as long as the Lord knows it's good enough and in my heart I, I do all these things not for people to see me but I'm doing this because I love the Lord the love of Christ constrains me I know my Father knows and that is good enough for me uh, then when we have this kind of a really a loving spirit towards God and towards one another oh, there will be peace and harmony and unity but if there's selfish ambition and pride, envy and strife, well, there's division, unholy division. Right? So true love does unite. And when it unites, it also divides because rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Right? And doctrine or truth does divide. Right? But it also unites as well. It separates itself, it divides from that which is unholy and untrue to preserve what? True unity, right? True unity and communism in spirit and doctrine and other things in the church. And sometimes when we want to have true and good fellowship and unity, uh, we must get rid of that which is unwholesome, right? Unwanted, false teachings, Wrong methods all must be removed, excised from the church before true fellowship and unity can exist. Right? So it works both ways. So both statements are true. So now no one should fail right, in the exam. You know how to answer. And I experienced this in my life, you know, in, even in FEBC, I thank God for the FEBC. I thank the, the Lord that he has, he has put me there to, to teach and to serve. And there are others serving together with, with me. I'm serving together with them. I thank God for the faculty at FEBC and for my colleagues, fellow laborers, Kwek Swan Yu. Das Koshi and others, and Kwek Swanyu and Das Koshi and me, I mean, we are quite different, you know. You notice that? We're not the same. We have our own personalities, own peculiarities, and, and, and different in character. There's a lot of difference, right, among us, between us. And all of us also quite strong-willed, right? Hard-headed too. Sometimes quite unmovable. I mean, we have strong personalities. And usually when you put these, all these people together, they don't work, right? But then we work very well together. We may be different in so many ways, but we work together well. Why? Uh, because of doctrine. We have good fellowship together. We co-labor in the work of the Lord. Why? It's because of 
well, love, right, right understanding and application of love, and also because of doctrine, we have this fellowship in spirit and in doctrine. Without this, I don't think we will be friends. I don't think I want Kwek Swan Yu to be my friend. <laughs> He's not my type. <laughs> okay. I don't think I'll befriend him. We are so different. You know, when we were in students in FEBC, Mrs. Toh put us in the kitchen, cooking duty. And of all people, you know, he was my partner. <laughs> so we cooked together. And then we quarrel. Quarrel over rice. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 well, I had to learn how to cook. So how to cook rice? So I asked my mom how to cook rice. So she taught me, you know, the cooking pot. How you put rice in and how much water you must put in so that it will cook nicely. So I, I heard my mom, I, I followed her instructions, but he, he wouldn't listen. <laughs> she has his own way. I said, too much water. He says, no, who says? <laughs> so, so my rice would come out nice and fluffy. <laughs> his one comes out wet and soggy. You see, your rice is not cooked properly. Then he would argue back. No, it is good. It is right. People like to eat this kind of rice. My kind. <laughs> so can't agree. So in the end, okay, we have to cook two pots of rice. <laughs> I'll cook one, right? My way, you, so you go and cook yours the other way and see who wants to eat yours. <laughs> but, you know, we couldn't agree. And there was this dissension. Anyway, but and even now in you know in ministry in as as uh, individuals, sometimes we have our disagreements. Sometimes we have heated arguments. But then there is yet still this this fellowship we have, which we cannot break away from. Because we have the same spirit, same heart to love the Lord and His Word. We have the same mind in terms of doctrine and truth and theology. And that's why we, we work together. There is this fellowship, right? Although our personalities are quite different. And we rub each other the wrong way. And yet we are working together. How is that? It's, you see, it's the spiritual, invisible work of God, right, in spirit. We are bound by the same spirit, by the same truth, and for, for the sake of the Lord and His kingdom and His people, yes, we work together. And we work together happily. So I'm very happy, glad and thankful for Him. And also Reverend Das Koshi. We also have our disagreements, heated arguments, but still we work together, right? Now that's the kind of fellowship we want to have. We are imperfect people. How can imperfect people come together in harmony, in unity, in this kind of a fellowship and work together to advance God's kingdom and to glorify God? Uh, there must be this spiritual, supernatural element, all right? Fellowship, this true fellowship which is spiritual, which is doctrinal. Uh, that is what moves us. Right? So important to have. We are bound by the truth. Fellowship in the truth. And that's what keeps us together. And you know, in, the, in practice, in a church situation, in the leadership? Can there be consensus, for example, in the session, when you have to make decisions? And sometimes there can be disagreements, there could, can be dissensions, 
and how to agree. And in, you know, in our church constitution, the session or the board of elders, when they want to do anything, they decide on to do something, everyone must agree. It must be by consensus. Consensus means it must be unanimous. Everyone must agree. Then it can what? Then it can move forward. Right? Then the decision can be, or resolution can be passed. But is that possible? To have consensus? Now, people in the world will think you're crazy, you'll not get nothing done. How a group of people coming together and how can you get consensus? Usually it's done by what? Majority. You vote and the majority, right? Uh, the majority vote carries. But our constitution requires us consensus. Is this biblical? I submit to you it's very biblical. There must be consensus. All must be in agreement. Is it possible? Yes. If you have what? Good and true fellowship. Right? Based on love, based on doctrine. There can be consensus. And this is demonstrated wonderfully by the apostles and elders in the first century. We turn to Acts chapter 15. Uh, look at the kind of fellowship they had, which is very productive and promotes the Lord's glory and His truth and His kingdom. You turn to Acts 15. Now you see the fellowship in action over here among the apostles and elders of the church dealing with a controversy, right? A controversy, a problem in the church. You turn to Acts 15. So what was the controversy? Look at verse 1, right? And verse 2, it says here, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So there are those who say, It's not enough to believe in Jesus, you must be circumcised in order to be saved. Right? When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Should Gentiles who have believed in Jesus Christ, should they be circumcised or not? So there are those who say they must be circumcised in order to be saved. And Paul and Barnabas were saying, no, the gospel is enough. Right? Faith is enough. No need for them to be circumcised. So, I mean, this argument, right? this disagreement, this debate, this controversy, a dissension, and it's no small dissension, something quite huge. And then you look further on in verse, verse 4 and 5, it says, and, and when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them, and there arose, there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. Right? These Pharisees had, had come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But they said that it was needful to circumcise them, these Gentiles who had become Christians, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So there was this controversy. How did the church solve this? Well, look at the fellowship that they had. Fellowship in spirit and in doctrine. So let's look at the council that met. They had a conference, a council meeting. The apostles and elders came together to consider, for to consider of this matter. And over here, we find Peter giving testimony. And when there had been much disputing, they were debating and arguing to and fro, so much of it cannot agree. Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, Ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth 
through my preaching, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And of course, Peter was talking about how the Lord moved him, directed him to Cornelius and his household, a Gentile, a centurion, right? Gentile. And Peter went, preached the gospel, and Holy Spirit came upon them, indwelt them. They got saved in a marvelous, wonderful way. And they believe, just like we. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as He did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, by faith and faith alone. All right? Didn't require any circumcision. And in their uncircumcision, when they believe, they receive the same gift of the Holy Spirit and salvation. Right? In their uncircumcised state. So this tells, this, this proves that God does not need anyone to be circumcised in order to be saved. It's just faith and faith alone. So here Peter gave testimony as evidence. And then, what else? And then Peter said, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? So no need for them to be circumcised. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. All right? By grace alone, through faith alone, they are saved. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul. And Barnabas and Paul also declared, giving their testimony and evidence that what, miracul what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them and after they had held their peace, James answered. So you have testimony and evidence, testimonial evidence from Peter and from Barnabas and Paul. How when they preached the gospel, the Gentiles believed, got saved, no need for circumcision. So you have evidence. And then James began, began to speak. James, the brother of our Lord, who later on got converted and became right, um, a leader uh, in the Jerusalem church. And then he stood up right, to, to say this, Men and brethren hearken unto me. Simon or Simeon, that's Peter, had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. Now James now presented the scriptures. This, this preaching of the gospel without the need for circumcision, right? For the Gentiles to observe the rituals of the Jews and just by believing the gospel they are saved, does it have a biblical basis? And the answer is yes. And he quoted from the scriptures. Now he appealed to biblical authority. As it is written in the scriptures, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down and I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is, that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. So don't, don't need to have them circumcised, but that we write unto them that they abstain from the pollutions of idols and from fornication, from things strangled and from blood. So they get it together. Great dissension. A lot of disagreement, there was controversy. And if you have a council of men who are full of the Holy Spirit, for indeed Peter was, Paul and Barnabas were, James also, they were full of the Spirit, full of Scripture. There may be dissension and disagreement but all these can be dispelled, right? When there is true fellowship, good fellowship, 
among men who are full of the Spirit and full of Scripture, they are guided by the Spirit. They are spiritually led. And they submit themselves to the authority of Scriptures. There can be what? Agreement. All right? The fellowship of Spirit and doctrine brings about unity. So that finally when, when it was concluded and James passed the sentence, no need for them to be circumcised, but just tell them they must what? Keep away from idolatry. All right? And from fornication. And then what's the result? Verse 22, Then please it, the apostles and elders with the whole church. Uh, with the whole church. So there was consensus. Everyone agreed right, to this good resolution and result. And all this due to what? Uh, you have this fellowship. Sameness of doctrine and of spirit. Right? No selfish ambition. It's not me against you, you against me. We must submit to the Spirit. We must think spiritually. And we see the Lord working in such a way. Gospel preached to the Gentiles. They got saved without being circumcised. Evidence. And then there's Scripture also to back it up. Biblical authority. Are you going to submit to what the Scripture says? Well, if you're a spiritually minded man, you say, yes, I must submit to Scripture. How can I just uh, go by my own thinking and opinion. I must follow what the Bible says. And there's scriptural basis and backing. And then evidence itself, so clear. These people are saved. They have the same Holy Spirit as us. And they manifest and demonstrate the Holy Spirit working in them visibly. All right. And Dr. Arthur Steele, you know, has said, when you have scripture, you have evidence, you can rest your case. But you can only rest your case if the people who hear these things are spiritually minded. Right? Full of the spirit and full of scripture. And will submit to the Lord, to his word and to his work. Scripture and, and testimony or evidence. Then there can be consensus. And there was consensus. I pray this is found in, will be found in your church. That's why in the Bible, when you want to appoint leaders in the church, elders or deacons, there is this criteria. You read of it in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, there must be careful selection. You want men to lead? Make sure they are full of the Spirit, full of Scripture. And yes, in the work of the church, in the work of the gospel, because we are living in an imperfect world with imperfect people, there are bound to be dissensions, disputations, disagreements. Of course, all these things must be ironed out. How? Uh, when you have true fellowship among leaders, who are full of the Spirit, full of Scripture, you will come to a consensus which is biblical and God-honoring and church-promoting. This is possible. But only if you meet biblical criteria. All right? In whom you choose as leaders, whom you have as leaders, and whether you will be totally submissive to the Lord and to His Word or not. And make sure you don't use the ways of the world right, to make decisions. Uh, you use the ways of God, principles and practices found in the scriptures to guide you. Then, yes, there will be this unity, this fellowship. You will have things in common, all things common. And I've experienced this in my life, in my ministry, now as a pastor in the church as well as, you know, principal in FEBC. Thank God, I thank God for now my fellow laborers, both in the church session as well as in the college faculty. There is this sameness of mind, of spirit, of doctrine. And yes, there are disagreements. We do argue in our meetings and disagree. 
not often, but these things come up. But when we go to the scriptures, right, and then we appeal to testimony and evidence, and let's look at history or things like this. And and when these things are they square with scripture and how God does things. And if we have a spiritual mind, submissive heart to the authority of the Lord and His Word, uh, we come to an eventual right, agreement, consensus, that we move forward. Uh, I see this happening. It's possible. So I'm thankful for that. Right? And I pray this will be maintained. And this is possible for you too. And if we follow biblical guidelines and pattern right it's an infallible pattern for us the word of god even in such practical matters and fellowship uh, this fellowship we must have must be very real right we must see it in our life in our practice it will bring good results this fellowship in in mind in spirit in doctrine will bring about unity all right and the promotion of god's word and work in the church and when people see this church they say i want to belong to this church you come to a church and then everyone is bickering and bad mouthing one another or bad mouthing the pastor of the session and then there is this uh, backbiting and infighting it will be such an ugly church and situation who wants to be be here it only what defeats right the gospel and destroys your testimony satan will have the upper hand so make sure you don't have all these things make sure your fellowship is good and true and the bible tells you how right and i'm glad now you know you come together to be full of scripture and also to be filled with the spirit continue steadfastly like this all right and I'm sure things will go up and up. And the Lord will give you the increase in due time. Which, in Acts chapter 4, that's what happened when, when they have such fellowship. What was the good result? In Acts chapter 2, all right, and then you read further on in, in, in verse 47, the last verse, says here, well, verse 46, And they continuing daily with one accord, this, this wonderful fellowship they have in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house that eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now this, this, all right, communism that is there. This unity of, of spirit and doctrine. This true fellowship, singleness of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. People want to be found in their, in their midst. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved uh, the lord gave the increase the church will grow uh, this is the secret to church growth and one important element is the fellowship what kind of fellowship you have in the church right now that's the secret to church growth not not health and wealth or you know bring the world in make it exciting for the young people with electric guitars and drums and dancing and all that you know and it's all fun and games and it's a false fellowship false growth but true fellowship uh, is like this and the lord gave the increase i pray this may, will be the case right in this church let us pray now, someone asked, what is the difference between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Someone also asked, can we just have instrumental music? Can, can we worship God with instrumental music?